Lee is a professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science. And he's a very special invite because he received his bachelor's and master's degree here from Ohio State. Burn, bird born and bred, right? Burn, bird, bird born bo and bred. Burned and bred. <laughs> um, so, and oh, and he also received his PhD from the University of Arizona. Um, Dr. Lampkin's prize for research is funded by NASA and the National Science Foundation. And he publishes his work in a lot of diverse journals, including um, JGR Solid Earth and Cryosphere. And I was looking at um, his citation index and I was amazed to see that like, I don't have nearly these many citations and several of his early papers have been cited over 200 times. I asked my mother to cite me, so it's all, <laughs> don't, don't believe that. Um, so we're really pleased to have him. Can you get the little, yes, you got something. Yes. Right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the wonderful invite and uh, uh, profound service that Anne has provided as an escort uh, here during my, my visit. <laughs> Uh, I, I, this is an emotional visit for me uh, because I was a student here that started in the Bird Polar Research Center in the spring of my freshman year. So the people in this building, some of whom are sitting in this office, you helped finish raising me, basically. And you are all excellent and peculiar parents. <laughs> I'm still going to counseling to deal with all the things you guys did to me. But... Um, what I received from this place was a profound sense of the broader world, um, a deeper understanding about how planets work, and the humanity of the people that are involved in this outstanding enterprise in the pursuit of understanding uh, the polar regions. So I owe to you a great debt of gratitude, um, and I thank you for letting me come back and visit and talk to you about the work I've been doing uh, for the time that I've left, not all the time that I left, because it's been a long time, um, but some of the time. Um, this particular research uh, is something I fell into by accident, but in a way it was kind of the place where I kind of got started. Uh, this was me back when I had more hair, uh, and we we're on um, Willens Ice Stream, Ice Stream B at the time, now they got names, right? Like that shows you how old I am. Uh, and that's Ian Willens there. It's my dear friend, and, uh, late Gordon Hamilton. Um, and uh, we were leaving uh, the field from this location, uh, Austral 93. And at that time, Ian Willens was studying the sheer margins of Willens Ice Stream. And we, he was attempting to try to understand the dynamics of shear margins and their influence on the ability for uh, these major West Antarctic ice streams to uh, transport substantive masses of ice from the interior of West Antarctica into the uh, Ross Ice Shelf. Um, this trip was uh, complete with <laughs> all kinds of insane things that happened, like a trip to an under ice base that had been closed for like 40 years um, and uh, a whole bunch of other misadventures that happened on that trip. Uh, but as an undergrad, it was a profoundly eye-opening trip, uh, both in terms of the experiences I had in the field and the nature of the science that was driving uh, compelling research questions of the time. And many of those questions are still of, peak, uh, of significant interest to us as glaciologists. And ice streams are, are in their dynamics are, are still an important component of, uh, of our research endeavor. At that time, I was deathly afraid of ice streams. You can imagine that you're going out on a snow survey, the GPS, the margins of an active ice stream. It's not a cakewalk for many people here who know that. It's a heavily crevassed, extremely dangerous area. And I was admonished many times about the, the perils of working in that region. Um, so as my current work uh, has found its way into uh, examining shear margins, I approached it with some, uh, with some fear that was translated from the field experience that I had during the Austral 93 season. Of course, we all know the compelling and large, uh, large overarching regions why we're interested in evaluating these large ice sheets. We have a complete underst a broad understanding about uh, their overall significance in the terrestrial climate. And from long-term reconciled monitoring, we have um, some constraints on understanding what the long-term mass changes have been. 
And obviously for Greenland, it's a really sad, sad ice sheet. It's losing a substantial amount of mass annually. And um, there's been debates in the community about what drives the large proportion of that mass loss. So since 1993, I've watched the proliferation of the importance of surface melting uh, become uh, prevalent in our understanding of trying to explain uh, mass loss from these large ice masses, particularly Greenland. Um, I've seen not so pretty debates, both in the literature and in meetings between our colleagues who were fighting about whether or not surface melt was important or whether or not uh, marine um, uh, forced um, uh, ocean water that uh, enhances calving at marine terminating glaciers is the predominant factor that's driving a lot of this mass loss. Um, and we've even seen more recent work that's tried to, uh, uh, proportion, to try to establish the proportion of the total mass loss observed here out of Greenland between uh, runoff and uh, solid discharge due to calving and presumably uh, due to enhanced uh, ocean heat forcing. Um, and I'm sure there will be continued debates about that. Where I found myself in this debate in some ways is at the interstitial spaces between these, these, these components. And the first place that led me to thinking about some of these issues of shear margins really was in the work that I was initially doing on superglacial lakes. So um, without enumerating the massive body of work that's been compiled over the last decade and a half, um, there's been a substantial amount of work uh, that has opened up our basic understanding about the role in which the superglacial hydrology of a warming uh, ice sheet um, uh, has and its impact on, on ice dynamics at multiple time and spatial scales. And I was one person among many, many who are in this audience who was, who was concerned about uh, understanding that component of the ice sheet system. So at that time, this was before people were coming up with fancy algorithms to automatically map superglacial lakes. So we were doing it by hand, digitizing and, and trying to do our best uh, to not make as many mistakes as we could given the limitations of our eyes. And I think my eyesight got worse by digitizing lakes manually the horrible, horrible thing to do to students, um, but it builds character. Um, and so uh, what I started noticing, probably like many of my colleagues uh, mapping superglacial lakes is uh, we started to understand things about their temporal and spatial dynamics, uh, their drainage behavior, uh, where they were, why they were where they were, why didn't they move around? Um, and one of the things I noticed in, in many of those exercises, especially in work that I was doing to try to constrain and understand why lakes were where they were, what was the surface topographic structures that were responsible for the capacity to collect surface meltwater, um, I noticed that there were ponds in shear margins, particularly in, in Jakobshavn's shear margins. Now at the time I thought, well that's darn peculiar. This seems like the most unlikely place to find water to pond. It's a heavily crevassed, extremely dynamic location in the ice sheet system. Why in the world would water pond there? And what would it do if it had behavior similar to the kinds of dynamics that we've seen in other superglacial systems outside of the shear margin? So we started to examine specific assemblages of, of uh, pond structures in the shear margins of Jakobshavn. And we wanted to think about what the broader implications are of, of, uh, of lubricating the shear margins or what we call hydrologically weak in the shear margins due to drainage from these structures. But it also opened up a much broader can of worms about what are the overall, overall other factors that can influence uh, destabilizing the shear margins as well. And that includes other processes like strain heating, uh, cryohydrologic warming, um, and uh, dynamic forcing is a function of proximity to the calving front. And part of the literature that, that uh, started to uh, speak to some of these issues were actually two papers um, that got me inspired to think about these problems. And one was, really wasn't just one paper, but a whole bunch of papers that Ian Joggin wrote um, about Jakob Chauvin. And many of us have all read his work and understand his positions about uh, his explanations for, for what has been driving the larger proportion of dynamic changes we've seen in Jakob Chauvin, which has been, um, you know, uh, ex accelerated mass discharge, enhanced calving, um, thinning, and uh, dramatic retreat of the uh, calving front. 
So Ian has gone out into the world and is beating on tables like it's all the ocean that's causing all of this and it's nothing else. And I remember a critical paper that came out shortly after one of those, one of those jogging papers by uh, Vanderveen, uh, Stearns and Plummer. And Case is another dear friend of mine and, and Lee's another dear friend of mine who are also uh, bird alum, uh, bird, former bird folk as well. And their paper, their 2011 paper, established that effectively uh, the, the perturbation, uh, instability at the front due to uh, calving perturbation has a limited spatial uh, effect. Basically, uh, that perturbation propagates upstream in, in a way like a diffusive kinematic wave. So the overall amplitudes of the effects are spatially limited, somewhere within the 15 to 20 kilometer uh, range upstream from the front. Yet we still observed uh, speed up uh, throughout the Jakobshavn ice, ice stream system uh, far up away from the, uh, from the calving front. So in that paper, uh, Van der Veen and uh, Stearns and um, Plummer postulate that something else weird must be going on that is not related to what's happening at the calving front. Maybe it's cryohydrologic warming, maybe it's meltwater, who knows? We don't know what it is, but we know it's something else. And he did a fairly nice uh, force balance assessment of of transects, uh, transverse transects um, along the ice stream. So he, he documented that quite well. So I read that paper and I got to think, well, I'm seeing these obvious ponds in the shear margins. Maybe this has something to do with uh, Van der Veen's argument. And this might be an ample place to explore how these structures might influence uh, ice dynamic flow. Now, the first assumption that I, I had was you flush a big toilet, the toilet water goes to the bottom of the ice sheet, it must lubricate the bed, reduce basal friction. And like the documented effects of many other superglacial lakes uh, that we've seen outside of shear margins, this should have a comparable effect. And what I thought is, oh, maybe it contributes to some proportion of the acceleration that we see in the main trough, in the main area of fast flow in Jakobshavn. But science is always interesting. It prevents us with, with some interesting um, uh, issues. So what this led to was a sequence of papers I've been working on in the last few years that where we incrementally try to contextualize and attack different aspects of, of the problems that are related to uh, the warming that produces copious amounts of melt in the shear margins uh, that produce these ponds and the ice dynamic responses that that could be born from uh, the, the filling and drainage of these superglacial ponds. As I mentioned though, along the way, this became one of those like Russian Kachina dolls, like the, you open one and there's another doll inside that's smaller and you open one and it's another one that's smaller and another one smaller. For you get the really one, it's really, really tiny. You can barely see it. And I was afraid of where this was gonna go because I didn't wanna go back into shear margins again. I didn't wanna go deep into the shear margins because I was scared. I was, Ian Willens made me frightened of going into shear margins. Um, so, First place I thought was, can we just simply characterize these features? Can we evaluate their variability, their spatial extent, and their behavior? And can we come up with a broad set of estimates of how much water is actually in them? So during this period, I was part of the Ice and Climate Research Group uh, headed by uh, Richard Alley and Sridhar Nandakrishnan. And I remember during one of the ice group meetings, I was showing them these pictures, and they're like, huh, water in the ponds, eh? Yeah, that's interesting. And then Rich, I'm going to do my best Rich impersonation, goes, you know what? I'm not sure there's just all that much water in the shear margins. Anybody that knows Rich, I, I, hopefully I did a good job with my impersonation of him. Hopefully he doesn't see this video. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, why don't we, we find out? The aerial extents are not all that large, right? You know, because it's a shear margin. It's a it's heavily crevassed. Why is water in a, in a, in a cracked up crevassed area? Um, so uh, in our first initial paper, our 2013 paper published in JGR, we went about to characterize these objects and to try to at least constrain how much water was contained in a uh, substantive and observed drainage event uh, during one of the, from one of the larger shear ponds. Uh, we wanted to answer questions like, what are these structures? Ponds and shear margins. Why are ponds in the margins at all? Dude, how do you get water to form in shear margins? What is the spatial and temporal variability of these ponds? and how much water is in them. 
as we uh, moved through that paper, we, it opened up more questions about, about this process. So then we started on, on embarking with my graduate, my PhD student, uh, to try to understand what the spatial and temporal variability of these ponds are and how it affects um, regional ice flow. And what, at that point, we were interested in seeing if there was any uh, substantive observations that we could capture that provided us with some evidence that there was any effect on the ice dynamic flow at all. So uh, we were interested in answering questions like, what, are the, what is the interseasonal variability of margin ponds? What impact do drainage from these features have on regional ice flow, both from an observation perspective and from a theoretical perspective uh, through the use of numerical uh, ice flow model. Later on, we started to ask questions like, well, how do these ponds behave over long periods of time? So if you go back uh, to my initial statement when I was talking about mapping, we were doing mapping from hand by hand, digitizing from optical satellite imagery. I remember getting a call from Tom Wagner, a program manager, former program manager at Cryo. And he's like, Derek, I know you like mapping. That's your thing, right? I was like, yeah, I do, I do okay. He says, uh, is there a way to automate this? And I said, well, you know, there's a possibility to do it, but it's heavily crevassed and the spatial resolutions are not good at resolving the, the surface roughness variability. So there's probably going to be, you know, a subst substantive amount of error that's associated with, you know, spectral based techniques. So we kind of had a conversation. He's like, well, let me draw some other people in. So some other people got involved in the conversation and some were like, well, we think we can do it, but you know, maybe it's a mix of, you know, manual and, and uh, non-manual. Um, so I said, well, I want to do a longitudinal study of these ponds, and I don't want to wait for the state-of-the-art automated techniques uh, to, to catch up to the, the level of, of, um, of uh, capabilities that we would need to do this well in a place with uh, a lot of challenging uh, properties. And um, I just don't have the time to burn out my eyeballs or some other student who's only going to be here for two years to do this over lots of data. So what is the fastest, quickest way we can do this? And the fastest, quickest way was to at least characterize the hydrologic state, the drainage state of these ponds. Are they filled? Are they drained? You look at an image, does it have water? Does it not? So very simple, but if you do that over several satellite uh, data, uh, spanned out over several uh, satellite platforms, you can put together a reasonably uh, uh, temporally resolved picture of what the variability of the hydrologic state was. So that's kind of the basis of this paper I did with my master's student. So we were trying to answer questions like, what is the long-term variability in hydrologic states, drain and fill states only? So it's a binary assessment of shear, pond, shear margin ponds. Then next, we started to ask ourselves the question, for the ponds that we could reasonably map over a decadal period, but not at the same temporal uh, resolution as this uh, study, could we characterize what the change in area has looked, looked like over time? And what does that correlate with, with other kinds of, uh, you know, regional controls, atmospheric controls? So that was the, the focus of this study. And in our uh, last kind of, and in that study also, we, we were interested in constraining what the upper bound ice dynamic effects were. So we did some diagnostic ice flow modeling to try to support uh, understanding what the effects were um, and test out the hypothesis that we thought uh, would be the effect of lubricating the, the shear margins that was established in the 2013 paper. And in our most recent work is because these drainage events can occur over relatively short periods of time, we realized that the ice dynamic response uh, regionally could contain both viscous and elastic components. So we sought out to try to characterize what the viscoelastic response would be to, to these drainage events and also, we had to embark on digging down deeper into the problem. So you start at the surface with a pond, you ride the, the ride down through a fracture, and presumably you get to the bed. And then what happens at the bed? The bed is where the rubber meets the road. And so we started to ask questions about what the characterization of the subglacial hydrologic system looks like at the bed, which ultimately influences what the ice dynamic response would be. So invariably, I found myself going farther and farther down the rabbit hole when I didn't want to as much, uh, but it's been a very interesting ride. And where we're at now, um, and I'll kind of highlight uh, for the rest of the talk uh, some of the findings from each of these studies. Where we're at now is considering, you know, what is the overall uh, 
possibility for augmenting the behavior and characterization of the shear margins throughout uh, Greenland's uh, major marine terminating outlet glaciers. What are the kind of set of processes that get enhanced as a function of warming? Um, which of these processes dominate and under what, con what conditions? Uh, what impact do weaker margins have on Greenland's overall mass flux? So how much does this matter to the overall consideration in the prognostic estimates for uh, what uh, Greenland's mass loss would be in the future under future scenarios of warming? So these are the places that we think this sequence of work can start to lead us to, uh, to, to answer some of these larger overarching questions. We're not there yet, but that's where we want to go. So here, out of our 2013 paper, you can see uh, Jakob Chauvin here. This is characteristic uh, rectilinear snake-like feature. Um, back when I was a student at Bird, we thought and still think Jakob Chauvin was a really outrageously fast outlet glacier. At that time, it was moving at around seven to eight kilometers a year, and our brains were exploding because I was like, wow, that's really fast. Now that thing is moving at upwards of 18 kilometers a year. So, um, and what's been associated with that is a dramatic retreat of the uh, calving front here. You can see the edge of the calving front here and lots of bergy bits and stuff floating around Melange and the uh, fjord. Um, it's thin and it's accelerated, even though recently there's been some documented evidence and conversations about a potential slow up, uh, which could be in some ways topographically controlled. And there's been some conversations of late about what's driving some of the more recently observed uh, slowdown. Um, but what we did notice were these ponds. And it turns out not all the ponds were the same. So you're looking at a, 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 a Landsat grayscale panchromatic image here, um, and you're not seeing all of the ponds uh, at their uh, peak extent uh, throughout any given melt season. So they don't always look like this all the time. Um, what we did is we went about uh, classifying them. We gave them some fancy designators so we can keep track of them. Uh, some were kind of complicated. So the ones that were a bit lower uh, downstream tended to be more spatially contiguous, like classic ponds. But the ones upstream, like CV6 and 7, were assemblages of, of fractures uh, that were water-filled. And so what we attempted to do is to try to delineate a system of these that were kind of more spatially co cohesive than the other ones. And it, it gets a little bit difficult in high melt years to distinguish this CV6 group from CV7. Uh, but we attempted to try to find a way to, to, to operationalize understanding uh, uh, their, their, uh, their extent. And also because of that, I should note that because they're, they're not all the same, the potential for their impact is different. And also, there's a reasonable amount of difference in the ice thickness, and hence the uh, vertical uh, magnitude of material that the surface melt water has to traverse in order to make its way to the bed uh, from CV1 to CV7. So um, all of these probably play factors in um, the drainage behavior, their spatial distribution, and their overall potential for influencing the flow margins, uh, the ice sheet shear margins. And I'll talk a little bit about what later on about what kinds of impacts I think these different systems might have um, and other types of systems that might be present in other marine terminating outlet glaciers throughout Greenland. Uh, so we went about uh, examining uh, these specific uh, ponds. At that time, uh, CV2 was kind of one of the largest spatially contiguous uh, images. This was from around 2007. In um, more recent data, uh, these pond assemblages are large, and some of them have gotten so large, they're now uh, encroached here into the interior of the, uh, of the region of main ice flow, and there's some additional uh, uh, structures that are showing up here, not in this image. This one has all but disappeared, and in large part because now the, the calving front is almost within three to four kilometers downstream from that, from that lake. So you know, very soon, it, it's just going to disappear, or calve away. So there's been some changes in these systems over time, um, and they haven't been, been static. 
one of the things we were interested in is why are they situated where they are? And what we did notice is in multiple uh, imagery, we found that th they're not moving. They're not evecting away. They're staying where they're at. So in the same way, we understood that there's strong topographic controls in the location of superglacial lakes in general. We assume that that's probably the case uh, for these shear ponds. So we went to look at uh, ice penetrating radar data and examine the structure of the basal topography. And it turns out that each of these lakes corresponds to these depressions along the, the uh, flanks of the shear margin. Um, and that's actually additionally peculiar to have water in that location because you have uh, large gradients in the, the basal topography, um, substantial amounts of uh, vertical shearing. Um, and so this is a really significant part of the flanks of the ice sheet system uh, to have water uh, existing in and, uh, and, and being drained into the, the bed. And so we, we basically found a way to characterize and understand and correlate these, these basal topographic structures uh, with uh, the surface features that we identified for each of these systems. And these are the other systems as well. Uh, on the bottom graph, I think, is uh, basal roughness. We also, in our 2013 paper, sought out to try to understand what the uh, a single season variability in the, in the aerial extent was, just try to get a sense of, of, of what their behavior was. Uh, so you, you can see that each system is broken down. These were the image dates that we had available. As you're all aware, oftentimes working with optical imagery can be challenging. Uh, that restricts the temporal capacity for doing uh, time chain studies, largely because of the influence of cloud cover. And that, that's, we're just stuck with that. Um, so we do the best we can to get the best samples that are available over, over our target areas. So we have June 6th, June 22, July 8th, July 24th, and August 9th for the 2007 season. Um, we've examined that as a function of, of a uh, PDD um, uh, uh, indicator or proxy for, for surface melt. And we examine changes in the cumulative uh, change in area. And so you can see in general that the peak accumulative change in area uh, or cumulative area, sorry, um, reaches its peak across most of all these CV systems or pond systems around the time that you reach the, the peak in the surface melt, which, which should make, make sense uh, given that, um, that this is a, a melt-driven process. Now, I would add here, and this is also another area of open-ended work that we're trying to explore, is what are the kinds of processes that allow for water to pond in the shear margins at all? This is slightly different than the kinds of dynamics that we would see in governing uh, the production, runoff, uh, and, and uh, storage of surface meltwater in standard ponds outside of the shear margins. That one's an easier way to conceptualize, right? Melt forms out in the flanks, uh, accumulates and, and, uh, and uh, gets aggregated as runoff across the, the surface, and it's a relatively continuous surface unless you've got s substantial amount of fracturing or crevassing for infiltration. And then that water just pours into local, uh, local depressions, fills them up and to create a pond. But how does this work in a place that's heavily crevassed? So we've been embarking on some work to try to answer that question. We're not com it's not done yet, but basically we're thinking about things like interfracture transport um, and uh, the ability for meltwater to be in situ produced along the interior of the walls of the crevasses, um, in addition to uh, slightly uh, outer uh, regions that are just slightly outside the, the edges of each of these lake or, or pond, uh, pond structures in which water could potentially infil infiltrate uh, through the fracture system. So we're trying to come up with some creative ways of thinking about how we explain why ponding occurs where it does. And it's not intuitive. Um, if you look at the pond structures themselves, they're relatively well uh, situated within the shear margins. So there's still substantial amount of crevassing and opportunity for infiltration from surface runoff outside of the margins and at the very edges of the margins. So it's unlikely that these ponds are being filled by water infiltrating from the outside. So it pre presents an, another complicated aspect of this problem in a really interesting science question uh, uh, and, and spin on the, on the whole superglacial uh, uh, dynamics or superglacial hydrology. Um, we also looked at this change in area with time for this uh, season. 
And you can see how uh, the, there's some overall coordinated behavior and when uh, each pond structure reaches its peak, uh, but there's some interesting variability uh, that shows some kind of temporal phase uh, that's probably, uh, and, and we've determined, um, you know, partially related to, to elevation. And, and that should make sense as well, uh, which is uh, consistent with what we see in um, uh, other superglacial lake systems. We also were asking ourselves, what is driving the drainage behavior of these features? Why do they drain when they drain and how do they drain when they drain? So the first option to consider is that these ponds are draining because you get enhancements and tensional stresses that allow for fractures to open up and allow for the water to drain. Pretty simple, right? Again, it's the kind of process that we've seen happen uh, that uh, triggers the drainage of other superglacial systems outside the shear margins. So we set out to try to uh, evaluate uh, uh, 2000, the season, uh, strain rates uh, during that season locally around each of these pond systems and um, try to see if we can correlate that with, uh, with drainage. And what we found was that um, it's not quite a clear picture. So what you're looking at here is, well, this one's, uh, sorry, elevation, and um, this was a, a crevasse filling rate. So we were looking at the rate of filling as a function of edge elevation to see if, if uh, we had extensive melt downstream um, at lower elevations where temperatures are maybe presumably a bit warmer. Um, and so we get more melt water produced. Um, and like I said, and in, and in less at higher elevations. And it wasn't quite linear as we might expect. Um, so there's some outliers like CV3 and CV7. And we're still trying to think about reasons why that might be the case. And it could be related to uh, localized uh, capacity for meltwater entrainment. Uh, that's a function of the, the, the uh, specific localized structures, topographic structures, or, or topographic structure in the vicinity of these, of these pond, pond features. Um, probably the most important one here that I, I would note here is our uh, estimated strain rates. Um, and this is a, a function of the drainage rate. And uh, you can see that that's not quite right either. And there's some interesting uh, outliers that deviate from a one-to-one -one relationship. And so that opened up additional mysteries. Well, if it's not uh, associated with um, enhancements and tensional forces, we thought that maybe that might be the case uh, closer to the uh, calving front for ponds close to the calving front because um, enhancements and tension could be uh, produced by, um, by the uh, initiation of calving, um, but that's not quite the case. So we reported it, we provided some speculations on what we thought were going on, but that's still not abundantly clear what is driving uh, that drainage behavior. And then lastly, we had to consider, I wanted to consider the really important question. Is there enough water here to matter? How much water, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? How much water does it take to lubricate a shear margin? Well, we set about first attempting to try to evaluate for one of the, the larger CV systems for that season, for the 2007 season, which is CV2 here. Um, we wanted to estimate uh, what is the depth of the fractures in which the water is entrained. Um, we went about two, two approaches, one that we knew wouldn't really be all that insightful, but we did it anyway. And that's using a classic uh, technique for estimating the, the depth of water by the attenuation of optical radiation through the water column. Um, and that's a technique that's been um, uh, reasonably well applied across many of the superglacial lake systems throughout Greenland uh, to characterize their depth and if you know the depth in the area, you know the volume of water. Uh, we also used a modified NIE approximation to try to find out where the maximum fracture depths uh, uh, could theoretically propagate to as a function, of the balance between the tensional uh, uh, strain and the um, ice overburden pressure that would seek to try to close the fracture. So the place where those two forces are in balance is the theoretical depth at which you would have the maximum extent of these fracture systems. So if you're able to assess that uh, through with, uh, throughout the uh, aerial extent of these ponds, then you can get a, an overall estimate of what the, uh, what the volume of water in these systems are. So this is a comparison of the depths that we calculated from both uh, techniques um, under uh, some varying uh, parameters. 
Uh, we looked at both airfield and waterfield um, uh, fracture depths from my modified NIE model. Um, and then this is kind of a spread of estimates from satellite based um, uh, derivations of uh, 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 water column depths uh, using the, the uh, attenuation model. So you can see this, these, these don't really kind of make that much sense because uh, the water, uh, the radiation gets substantially extinguished uh, well before you get to the bottom of any one of these crevasse systems. So I think what is most illuminating is, is this information here. The water field uh, nigh crevasse depths, which are somewhere on the order of 200, uh, 100 to a 200 uh, meter depth. And that's, you know, well over three quarters of the ice thickness for, for many of these uh, superglacial uh, or many of these uh, shear pond systems. It's a little bit less when you move to higher elevation where the ice thicknesses get a bit, a bit thicker, somewhere on the order of close to a kilometer. Um, but that's really deep, deep fractures. And so that's enough to be able to get water to the bed. And it's also enough if you account for the slightly reduced area relative to other superglacial lakes, but really deep fractures, then that means you got a reasonable amount of volume of water sitting around in the, in the, in the margins. So we sought to use this information for the CV2 system to try to estimate uh, what the uh, total amount of water drained during a single drainage event. So um, probably the number that's most important to pay attention to here is the upper bound ep estimate from a modified NIDEP. This is a 3D model. I think we made this from uh, this, uh, the optical attenuation depths. It's just a fancy visual aid, but it gives you an idea of kind of what this pond system looks like. So this is the main trough here. This is the ice flow direction. And here's the lateral boundaries of the amalgamated extent of this pond over that 2007 season. And so this is the estimates that we got for the total volume of water uh, that we think drained during a single drainage event. Now, if you go back and you compare that to uh, the volumes of water that are estimated to drain from traditional superglacial, non-shear -shear superglacial lakes, it's actually quite substantial. It's a decent amount of water. So the next question you gotta ask is, what happens when you put all this water at the bed? What can happen to this, to this shear margin? So through several conversations with my collaborators, we started to formulate what we thought could be the effect if we saw comparable levels or comparable magnitudes of basal lubrication due to drainage from these shear ponds all along the length of Jakobshavn where they're present. And the first uh, notion was, well, maybe we'll get acceleration in the main trough. But the other notion that we, we started to think about was that maybe the real impact is in the extra marginal field. And so the initial idea was that as you get uh, lubrication, you accelerate locally the mass flux into uh, into the main ice stream. So you get entrainment of that ice mass and then that column of ice uh, that has been accelerated into, into the main, main flow, the area of main flow. You enhance uh, membrane stresses, intentional stresses that propagate out into the extra marginal field and accelerate the extra marginal field, supposedly. I had a really nice cartoon for that. Ken Jezik used to make me write a whole bunch of hand cartoons. He's like, don't go around messing around mapping things and making graphs, just draw a cartoon. I won't say anything else about Ken. But, um, so here's one of my, my Ken cartoon graphics of this. So here you've got drainage, you've got basal lubrication, you've got upstream enhancements in longitudinal stresses, and uh, that accelerates the ice and um, enhances mass discharge. So if you thought about this and you extrapolated this logically, what this looks like is the potential for dilating the catchment area of these major marine terminating outlet glaciers, effectively drawing ice from a bit farther away from the area where the main action is happening and propagating the effects in a localized area much farther away. So what this means is that there's a potential for these systems to have a scaled effect in the overall ice sheet system. You have a localized phenomenon single pond here or assemblages of single ponds, but their effect can be felt wide and, and relatively far um, and uh, enhance the amount of mass, potential mass flux into these outlet glacial systems and contribute to the uh, total mass flux uh, out of the Greenland ice sheet. 
Additional work that we did attempts to try to explore the problem space that's associated with this hypothesis. I'll move forward a bit here. Uh, oh yeah, this is the, the results that we had from uh, one of the, our pieces of work, the 2018 paper, uh, where we characterized a, a longer term change in area for multiple seasons. Um, and you can see that we reach a uh, peak extent, aerial extent in the month of July, or between June and July. Um, and what we've seen from 1998, or 2000 to 2014, we've seen an overall increase, except for this anomalous year, in the, in the aerial extent. And that tends to track quite closely with what we've seen in other observations of other superglacial systems uh, outside of the shear margin. So I won't spend too much time on that, but that, that highlights what the temporal variability in the, in the uh, decadal scale uh, uh, aerial extent looks like. This highlights uh, results from one of our papers that looked at the hydrologic state. Uh, so we just took every possible data set we could get our hands on, and then we just looked at them. We're like, we know where our pond system is. In this image data, is it filled with water or is it not? And if you get enough data from enough places, kitchen sinks, anywhere you can get them, uh, binoculars, whatever, we can strap students to balloons and float them over. We thought about doing that too, but I didn't want to get sued. Um, then you can put up, you can put together a pretty nice kind of drain and uh, filling kind of climatology uh, in, in, the, in the overall temporal behavior of the systems. So we see that their total field occurrences are maximum in July. What's kind of interesting here is like, you've got drainage events down here in September. And what's not going to be so abundantly clear in the next slide, because it's not always the best graphic to project, uh, this is what we've we learned about these systems that was really most interesting was that they demonstrated multiple filling and drainage events in one season. And in some season, the final drainage of a particular system lasted well into September, late September, and sometimes early October. So that means that we had multiple opportunities for the shear margins to be perturbed by this hydrologic process in one season. And that was kind of an interesting finding about these, which says a lot about what the dynamics of the factors that are controlling the ponding capacity in the shear margins, um, <clears throat> and also the availability of conditions to drive continued melt throughout the melt season, even later into the melt season. Now we started to think about how are, are there ways we can explore our hypothesis about this extra marginal accel this acceleration in the extra marginal field as a function of uh, hydrologically perturbing and weakening the shear margins. So we start, sought out to do some numerical modeling, and the attempt here wasn't to reproduce the Jakob Chauvin uh, system um, accurately, but to just attempt to try to diagnostically provide upper bounds on what the uh, spatial distribution of acceleration would look like, to characterize where this acceleration would occur and what the general magnitudes would be under a range of varying conditions. So we set out to use uh, ISSM um, implementing um, or treating ice as a conservation of linear momentum problem, uh, assuming uh, acceleration is negligible, ignoring Coriolis effects, and uh, implementing um, a steady state model using the Shelfie stream uh, ice flow model. I got hammered by Olga, a lot, Olga Karinko, uh, about the use of particular configurations of the momentum balance for dealing with the shear margins. So don't, she's already beat me enough. And I, we can talk offline about that because some of you will be like, well, you know, I noticed that uh, the shelf stream is not appropriate in terms of the configurations for all the components necessary to model the vertical, you know, uh, gradients and, and, and horizontal shearing. And we could talk about that. But the important thing to note is that the uh, configuration of our model allows us to at least reasonably provide some, some uh, upper bound estimates on this problem. And also Byron and I worked uh, at that time to try to come up with a simplified uh, Coulomb style basal friction law uh, that allowed us to be able to, to uh, modulate the, um, the magnitude of the uh, effective pressure as a function of the amount of, of a water or the presence of a water available within a particular zone. So that was a kind of nice additive feature that we uh, provided uh, to the overall suite of uh, ISSM capabilities. Uh, so we did, uh, we did the modeling in three phases. We did an inversion phase uh, in order to uh, uh, 
derive a, a reasonable estimate of the basal friction field. So we use ISSM's um, uh, um, um, internal um, inversion capabilities uh, to try to get this estimate of basal friction field by holding all other parameters fixed. We're able to re, uh, minimize the difference between the modeled and measured velocities. And from that, you're able to tune an estimate of what the basal friction looks like, basal friction field looks like, uh, technically basal friction coefficient. Um, that's used then uh, to prescribe this forward model, which is a no water uh, um, uh, baseline case. And then we go through and in the effective areas of which we had the accumulated uh, aerial extent of these ponds over that decadal period, we lubricated the bed in those areas using our, uh, our uh, custom uh, basal friction law. And then we just were interested in what are the differences in the uh, velocities as a function of these uh, lubrication events, um, largely uh, in the extra marginal field. So this gives you kind of an overall idea of where we see the largest proportion of, of percent change from that baseline case when we lubricate all of these ponds simultaneously. Now you might ask, dude, that is not even realistic. They don't all drain at the same time. No, they don't. Remember, this is an idealized case. And so uh, these are transects here uh, outside into the southern margin. Um, we really got more specifically interested in the southern margin because many of you have spent time looking at Jakob Chauvin. The northern and southern margins are not the same. Um, the entrainment of ice in the northern margin happens somewhere here in the sharp inflection point. And most of the length of Jakob Chauvin along this northern margin, the ice is just the freeboard ice or the uh, extra marginal ice is kind of just being dragged along. And then it eventually gets entrained somewhere right in here. Um, <clears throat> which makes the impact of, of uh, evaluating this process a little bit different than the southern margin. The southern margin actually has multiple in, uh, entry points in which ice can get a train and train over a much larger effective uh, 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 length. So we tended to focus on the southern margin more than we did the northern margin because we thought that's where you can get from this effect, the largest proportion of mass flux uh, into the ice stream. Here's more of a look at this, but basically uh, you get an amplification of ice up to 20% in flow speeds, uh, about 10 kilometers away from the margins, which is approximately an increase of about a um, little over a half a gigaton of year of ice into the ice stream. Now, I remember a reviewer when I submitted some of this early work to a uh, Nature Geoscience, one person wrote, this is really interesting work and uh, this should be published with some minor revisions. And the other person was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And the reason why it's so dumb is because that's such a small amount compared to the total amount of mass loss out of the ice, ice stream due to these other factors like oceanic forcing, that it doesn't even matter. You guys all know characters like that in our field. They're like, this doesn't even matter. But that may be true. There was some truth to that. That, I wouldn't say it doesn't necessarily matter, but there's some truth to the fact that the enhancements of, of estimated mass flux due to lubrication from this process is not enough to compensate for the mass loss out of the terminus. That's true. And if that was the case, it would stymie the retreat of the ice stream. We would have already seen that, right? And we would start started asking questions. Why is the ice stream uh, stop retreating? And that's because you would be gaining more mass uh, by a, some process like this, then we would be losing mass by other processes like uh, uh, terminal, terminal dynamics. So in that regard and in that context, yes, it's, it's not enough to compensate. But it says something about the fact that this is an interesting process that under future warming scenarios could be quite substantial. I don't know if for this ice stream system or other outlet glacier systems if it will be enough to stymie or offset uh, the, the mass loss, or to be enough to accelerate even more mass loss. But it certainly gives us an indication that there's another dimension of which the ice sheet system can respond in ways that we hadn't fully uh, thought about in this way before. Uh, in subsequent modeling studies, we tended to focus on looking at variability along these flow lines, so this flow line one through four. Um, we did some transient uh, flow modeling to try to look at what a single season would look like and characterize the speed ups along these 
uh, flow lines in the extra marginal field when we lubricated all of these uh, CV systems simultaneously. So we looked at the, we, we, we modeled uh, the 2013 to 2315 season. And we were also very much interested in seeing if we can find some observational evidence of uh, acceleration in the extra marginal field. So we set about looking for satellite data or any other kind of data that could allow us to do that. Uh, so we were fortunate enough to work with Twyla Moon um, and by proxy uh, Mark Fonestock. And we uh, were able to get access to uh, uh, Landsat uh, OLI based uh, surface velocity measurements. Now this data set has some issues. It, the estimates of surface velocities from a technique like this carries over some of the, the constraints that we have working with optical imagery at all, and it's cloud cover. Cloud cover then makes it difficult to constrain, uh, a, provide a consistent set of constraints in the estimates of the uh, temporal variability in the ice flow derived from this technique over extended periods of time. So we did have some issues with, with periods when we had biases in our assessments because we just had low sampling. Uh, opportunities due to cloud cover, and that, that, that shows up. But what you're looking at here is a distance away from the shear margin along these flow lines uh, for each of these uh, individual years, 2013, 2014 season, and 2015. Um, we attempted to try to qualitatively, in a way, correlate uh, instances of drainage and you'll notice that these drainage events actually span a potential range, and that's because we were only able to assess a particular drainage event by satellite imagery that's at a minimum separated by 16 days when a pond appeared in one and then disappeared in the subsequent scene without any additional samples in between. So, you know, we could have had drainage at any time from the point of observation uh, the first observation to the second observation after a 16-day interval. So we don't know where in that 16-day interval that occurred. Some of these intervals were a little bit longer because we had even more extensive uh, cloud cover, uh, which means that it could have been protracted out to 32 days. Um, we looked at uh, deviations in a background uh, velocity, a baseline velocity, to try to get a sense of whether or not we see anomalous acceleration along these flow lines that could be correlated with these drainage events, eh, if you close one eye and you wink and you, know, and you use a, you know, a telescope, you could maybe see that there's some kind of relationship. We did see some peaks here associated with co potentially coordinated, temporally coordinated drainage from most of these uh, CV systems. You'll also notice, as I mentioned before, these, some of these systems can drain um, multiple times in one season. Um, we had some other weird things going on here and here. Uh, we think these might be related, and they're discussed in the paper, uh, to uh, uh, sample uh, issues, sampling issues, where we've got biases in the averages that we calculate due to reduced numbers of samples because of cloud cover. Um, and then these are ma maxed observed speeds along these, these distances. So you can see that closer to the, uh, uh, the shear margins, the effect is most pronounced, and then it kind of exponentially decays as you move farther and farther away from, away from the shear margin. I'll skip over this. Yeah, this was our, uh, this was our um, transient modeling. So you can see here that we used our numerical model to uh, perturb and lubricate the bed at different uh, duration intervals to try to get a sense of, of what the uh, overall effects would be. And then we're able to uh, calculate estimates of what we thought the enhancements of mass flux through the northern and southern shear margins and the totals derived from both um, uh, over these effective periods. Um, so we've, we've estimated that most of all of that enhancements in, in uh, steady state mass flux is largely coming through the su southern margin. Um, I'm not sure what that does in terms of thinking about the dynamics on the northern margins. If you're accelerating ice at a criti critical constrained location, uh, that might have some very interesting effects in what's happening at the calving front as the calving front starts to, re to retreat to the point where it gets substantially close to that sharp uh, horizontal inflection point in the, uh, in the flow field. So that's something we haven't taken a look at, but I think it's an interesting prospect to examine. 
And last but not least, all of this has now led down to where the rubber meets the road. And we really started to think about, well, what's happening in the subglacial hydrologic system that can influence the potential ice dynamic response when you pump meltwater into the system? So we started thinking about looking at uh, a hydropotential surface under these ice streams. Behind this graphic is a long story of me running around begging colleagues who are developing some really nice and fancy subglacial hydrologic, evolving subglacial hydrologic models to see if we can come up with a way to, an ad hoc way, couple our, our ice dynamic uh, flow modeling to an evolving subglacial hydrologic system, hydrologic model uh, uh, operating uh, in, in two, two dimensions. And I went through all kinds of crazy stuff begging Marl Verder and some other characters to do that. Uh, we did get a chance to work with Glenn Flowers and work with uh, one of her uh, simpler models to try to constrain uh, for the transition from a link cavity or distributed system into a channelized uh, R channel system, what the uh, estimates of evacuation time would be from the points of entry, uh, presumably at locations where these ponds are draining. The other problem we, we were thinking about was where would the most effective response be if you consider the propagation of water throughout the subglacial system? And so what it means is that we might uh, potentially get um, more substantial uh, uh, ice dynamic response enhancements and effective basal pressures uh, where the uh, hydropotential surfaces are likely, the gradients are likely larger and not so much in places where the gradients are, are not so high, which means that that opens up a more complicated picture about how each of these, these uh, pond structures can have an influence on the ice dynamic response along the length, length of the glacier. So that means that it's, it's, it's not uniform or not homogeneous. Um, so we started in, in one of the papers we're working on now where we've done uh, viscoelastic modeling to try to add this component to it to open up the conversation about where we think the effects would be uh, most pronounced. So in conclusion, uh, we think this has opened up a very interesting avenue of work to try to understand these dynamics. A very interesting story has unfolded around this. So uh, sometime uh, late last spring and, and part of fall, uh, Johannes Bonzio came, came out with a really sweet GRL paper. And the paper basically indicated that you don't need cryohydrologic warming. You don't need ponds draining. You don't need Jesus. You don't need anything. All you need is for the front to just get broken off due to calving. And that calving explains everything. So Johannes very interestingly uh, developed a bit more of a more representative Jakob Chauvin model. And what he did is he parameterized damage in the shear margin. So his premise was, if you just fracture the crap out of the shear margins, you'll weaken them so much that you can propagate the effect of, of, of perturbations at the calving front well into the extra marginal field to the point where you don't need all this crap to explain it. And I was just like, I, I called Johannes up and I was like, dude, that's a really good paper, but don't you think it's half the picture here? He's like, no, it explains everything. I'm like, well, ponds are based on an observation. We saw that, right? But we don't see how damaged the shear margins may or may not be. And the levels, the ways in which he, he treated the damage was, was a little oversimplified as well, to the point where I think some attribution from the damage encapsulates some of the effect from the shear margin drainage as well. And I said, you know what? I don't think it's an either or. I think there's an interesting combination here. There could be very interesting interactions between uh, the drainage uh, dynamics and the damage behavior or the effect of damage on the dynamics of shear margin. I said, why don't we explore that together? He's like, nah, I solved it. I don't need you. You take your ponds and go play somewhere else. So I was like, okay, I'll take my ponds and go play somewhere else. So I'm currently working on an idealized model where we're trying to tease apart a set of, of, of idealized uh, interactions between strain heating basal lubrication and damage. And hopefully we can, again, provide kind of a diagnostic upper bound on what the proportional uh, theoretical effects are of each one of these processes. 
And what I think this, where, that, where this goes when you project this into the real world is that not all outlet glacier systems are the same and not all of them are the same along their length. So that any one of the proportions of any one of these pro processes being dominant probably varies along the length of these outlet glacial systems. That makes for some very interesting uh, premises in what the long-term stability of these ice sheet systems are. So as a Gedunken experiment, let's think about this. Let's think about an outlet glacier that is substantially uh, modulated by ocean entrainment of ocean heat fluxes into their, their fjords, right? So that you get a lot of calving, so that in large part, you get enhancement of damage, particularly in the lower part, the lower trunk or reaches of those ice streams, right? So it's in those places where the damage could be much more substantially uh, significant in influencing in, uh, in, in enhancements of ice flux in, from the extra marginal field than upstream where maybe you've got the proliferation of ponds and drainage of those ponds. So in a single system, you can have multiple processes influencing the overall ice dynamic behavior of these outlet glacial systems. In my opinion, I think it behooves us to think about how all of these interesting and complex processes interact for each one of the individual outlet glaciers that have their own unique personalities. So that's my perspective about how I think would be an interesting way to go forward. And along the way, we can answer a lot of very interesting questions and potentially improve our ability to prognosticate the stability of the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, without enumerating all of these things, I will stop at this point and take questions.